Good morning. Let's stand to our feet. Put your hands together. I don't know about you, but sometimes I could use God waking me up. And His love is here to wake you up today. Your love awakens me. Come on, sing about it. There were walls between us. By the cross you came and broke them down. You broke them down. There were chains around us. By your grace we are no longer bound. No longer bound. You called me out of the grave. You called me into the light. You called my name and then my heart came alive. Your love is greater. Your love is stronger. Your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Your love is greater. Your love is stronger. Your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Come on, sing it out. Feel the darkness shaking. All the dead are coming back to life. I'm back to life. Hear the song awaken. All creation singing, we're alive. Cause you're alive. You call me out of the grave. You call me into the light. You call my name and then my heart came alive. Gateway, my name is Misty, and we are so glad that you decided to join us today. Our mission, the reason why we exist, is to help people to take a step in the right direction, and we certainly hope that we can help you to do that today. We're continuing our summer series called Pilgrim's Progress, and that's a book by uh, John Bunyan, and we hope that you'll join us on in that journey. If you are newer here with us or our guest, welcome. We're so glad that you came. Just to invite you after our morning is done to visit our guest services area out in the atrium. We have a little Tim's gift card for you and uh, we'd love to get to know you better. I'm going to give you a moment now to say hello to those around you. Maybe share a summer highlight that you've already had or something that you're looking to and we will be back shortly. <laughs>
Good morning and welcome to church. Last week we had over 200 children here each and every morning for Maker Fun Factory Day Camp. And we are so thankful for the over 80 volunteers who joined them each morning and presented the good news that God loves them and that He has a plan and a purpose for each and every one of them. And so we just wanted to take a minute to thank each and every one of those volunteers. And I could go through the list, but like I said, 80 names. And they were all here every morning with a smile on their face, a coffee in their hands, but a smile on their face, eager to invest in the lives of these children. And you know, the investment may start here in a day camp when the children are young, but investing in people lasts a lifetime. And so we are starting a campus at Western University this fall. And before we do that, we want to go into it prayerfully. And so for that reason, we're having a prayer meeting this Tuesday night, July 18th at 7 o'clock p.m. at the UCC building on campus. If you have any questions, you can get a hold of Charles Kurugu. Um, either find him in the atrium or email him at charles at wearegateway.ca and he can answer any questions that you might have. But we just want to invite you to be part of Gateway's Next Steps. And speaking of investing, I just want to let you know that we have two new giving options available for you. We're working with a Christian company called Tithely to present to you app-based giving and text giving. Now, if that's something that you're interested in, you can get a lot more information on our website at wearegateway.ca slash giving. And you could also email me, Janine, at wearegateway.ca if you have any questions and I can hopefully help you um, answer those. And so we're just really excited about this new option and wanted to make sure that you know about it. Have a great day. Well, again, so good to have you all with us today. And again, a great, great big welcome as this. Many of you are on your summer holidays and you're just kind of uh, uh, relaxing and having some fun. I hope that this is an opportunity for you to relax and engage with your family and your friends throughout the summer months and that this is a blessing, that our services are a blessing to you. We're going to invite the ushers to come on forward, receive your tithes, your offering, your giving. God bless you as you continue that throughout the summer months and are attentive to that. God bless you. And uh, we are just, again, uh, I got a, a text message about midnight last night, our first missions trip that's gone up to Long Lac. They arrived safely after 17 hours of driving, and so they'll be working with uh, First Nations Indigenous people and uh, looking forward to hearing some great ministry from them. Let's pray. Lord, we are so grateful that we get to be a part of what you're doing in Jerusalem, Judea, and around the world, here and in various regions of Ontario and to the uttermost parts. So Lord, we just thank you that you led us to be a part of that. And, and Lord, we're also cognizant that there are people here today, they're hurting, they're going through some tough times. It's a holiday time and so for many people it's just kind of relax and chill, but for others, they've got some big decisions and they've got some tough circumstances. Lord, we just bless them, pray for them. We want to encourage them and I ask, Lord, you put your arms around the bottom. And those of us who know who they are, may we be an encouragement to them. To those that are here today and are hurting, may they know they're not alone. You've never left them. You never will. So now, Lord, just take this offering. Would you just bless it, build your kingdom with it. May we be a part of what you're doing. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you as you give today. As you give today, we're going to sing a song that is all about the amazing things that God did for us. He sent his son, Jesus, to come and to die a cruel death on a cross so that we could know him. He is an exalted and an amazing and a wonderful God. So lift up your voice with me and let's sing about it. From heaven's throne you came to us and set your heart upon the cross. We'll never know the sacrifice you made. For all our sin and all our shame You took the nails and took our place No one else could do what you have done Will you stand with me? Sing it out. One name is higher One name is stronger Exalted over all From the grave where death would die You rose again and brought us life You're reigning now 
the Savior of the world. Jesus, you reign now. You're reigning now, the Savior of the world. Just one more time, sing this with me. Sing that chorus one more time. One name is higher, one name is stronger than any grave, than any throne. Christ exalted, the only Savior. Jesus Messiah, to you alone our praise belongs, Christ exalted all around. To you alone our praise belongs, Christ exalted all around. We exalt you, Lord. Exalt you, Lord. Lord, today we want to tell you that you are exalted. And you went to great lengths, Lord, to show us your grace and your mercy and your provision. Lord, you have done so much to show us your love and that you have a path for us to follow. And Lord, today we want to tell you how much we need you. We want to tell you how much we desire to follow in your ways. And Lord, we mess up so many times. Lord, will you forgive us? Will you set us back on that path? We need you, Lord. Lord, I come. I confess. Bowing here, I find my rest. Without you, I fall you're the one who guides my heart. We need you, Lord. Lord, I need you, Lord. 
things that was really strongly impressed on me as we were singing that song is that sometimes we really feel self-sufficient sometimes we really feel wise in our own strength and strong in our own wisdom sometimes we feel that that we can't even acknowledge all the ways that we desperately need our God because we're not always aware of them I don't know about you but I'm so glad that I can take a breath this morning and breathe air in that the Lord has enabled my lungs to breathe. I'm so glad I get to partake of freedom and of salvation so rich and free and of grace that pardons my sin and of mercy that the Lord shows to me and of compassion which God gives to us without measure and of forgiveness which he extends to those who come to him in humility I don't know about you but I am so glad today I desperately need those things in other words you and I desperately need our God today these are all from his hand thank you Lord for who you are and what you give us and what you bestow on us and the ways in which you pour your love and grace and forgiveness into us Lord we need you today and Lord will you be exalted in our lives and in our praise will you be exalted in the decisions we make and the steps we take and Lord teach us today what it means to follow you no matter where you call us we need you in your name we pray Amen. 
Amen. Thank you for singing with us. You may be seated. Well, good morning. So good to have you all with us here today and welcome to our summer series. We are looking at one of the most popular books, a book study that we're all doing together in our cottages or in our road travels around our backyards with our family, with our friends, with our, our children. Arguably one of the most popular books ever written, second only to the Bible, and that's Pilgrim's Progress. We have gone through two sets of orders. We are now on back order. I think we've cleared out most of the warehouses in the country. We should have our last shipment sometime this week. We will send out a notice uh, on Facebook and on our app to let you know how to get your own copy. If uh, <clears throat> you still need one, and you can contact the church so that you can catch up if you haven't. It's the story of a person's journey to the celestial city. It's the journey to heaven. And as I was thinking this week, as I was reading through the portions again, it's just a good reminder for all of us temporal, earthly people that we're just passing through this life. We need to remind ourselves, folks, that the goal is not to make here feel or look like there. Let me remind us again. The goal is not to make here to feel or look like there. We're not trying to create heaven here on this earth. I hear sometimes that the church is criticized for talking about heaven too much, that life is in the here and the now, and that we're called to make this place a better place. And I think that's honorable. I think that there are some aspects to the Christian faith that we are to bring about some good here on this earth. But, but I don't think we talk about heaven enough. The goal is not, in life is not to make a better here and now. The goal in life is to prepare me for there and then. Here is temporary. Heaven is eternity. Do it here right. Absolutely. Do it best. Do it with all of your heart. But make sure you know what the goal is. Make sure you know what the plan is, that the destination is worthy of the journey. And in so many ways, while this book was written in 1675, it so beautifully describes our journey today as followers of Jesus Christ. The book begins with this phrase, there once was a man who had a book in his hand and a burden on his back. There once was a man who had a book in his hand and a burden on his back. And the book, of course, is the scripture, the Bible, that becomes both his compass and direction for this journey. And the burden, the burden on his back is sin. I saw in my dream that Christian was back on the path. His burden seemed heavier than ever. He wondered if relief would ever come. But Christian's faith kept him moving forward. He would soon find himself at a place called Salvation.
You have given me rest by your sorrow. In life by your death. Peace be with you. Your sins are forgiven. Study these words, as they will give you strength for the journey. You must present this at the gates of the Celestial City. Guard it with your life. These are for you. Now, I saw in my dream that Christian started down the path with renewed strength and purpose. With his certificate in hand, he was sure of heaven. Not far away, two men were also making their way to the path. He was about to stumble upon formalist and hypocrisy two happy-go-lucky characters who were blazing their own path to heaven. Gentlemen. Hello. Hi. How are you? Fine. Where are you from? We are from the land of vain glory. Yeah, where are you headed? We're headed to the celestial city to, uh, to get praise. Why didn't you come in through the gate? I mean, isn't it written that those who don't enter through the door will be seen as thieves and robbers? It doesn't apply to you, but it really doesn't apply to us. And if you knew how far it was to the gate from where we live, you'd be taking the shortcut as well. Well, isn't that going against the will of the Lord of the city? <laughs> <laughs> you, you worry too much. Our people have been taking this shortcut for centuries. Now, it, it's been our way since, well, since anybody can remember. I am sure that the impartial judge at the city will let us in. <laughs> anyway, we're both on the same path. How are you any better off than us? That's not what I'm saying. I'm, you, you can't go around making up your own rules. I mean, as it's written, I just, I don't think the king's gonna allow you guys into the celestial city. Huh, hmm. you got some great ideas there. So won't you go ahead and just jot those down, get your thoughts together, and we'll go over them, and uh, we'll uh, see, uh, see what comes of it. Very right. promising. Come on. Come on. In my dream, I saw that the new companions started down the path and were making very good time. It did not take long before they found themselves standing in front of the Hill of Difficulty. Now, formalists in hypocrisy were in the habit of taking what they thought would be the easy way. So rather than climb the hill, one took the path called destruction, and the other took the path called danger. They were confident that they would meet Christian on the other side. We're all on the same path. So does it matter how we get there? I mean, aren't we all in this together? I want you to take a few minutes and I have a question for you to discuss amongst those whom you came with us. When was the last time you faced a difficulty? When was the last time you faced a challenge before you and you were tempted to take the easy way out? When was the last time you were like, oh, this is gonna be heavy, this is big, this is tough. Uh, you know what, there's an easy way. And how'd that work out for you? Take a few minutes, we'll be right back.
So as we pick up on the story, <clears throat> Pilgrim has just gone through the pit of despair. And in week one, we talked about how we find our place in, in places of disparity. And when we do, we want to blame others, but rather that disparity can often be about our choices. We Then in the second, we looked at worldly wise men and the difference between being wise in our own eyes or being wise in the way in which God leads and guides us through his word. He leaves Mr. Legality in the city of morality. He walks through the wicked gate. He visits the house of the interpreter, which there are seven rooms which the Holy Spirit guides him through, each necessary if he's going to make it on his travels. And all of that is in the first few chapters, and I would encourage you to read that all for yourself. He comes to the place of the cross and there his burdens roll off, off of his back and Pilgrim now becomes Christian. And along the way he comes to the place of a hill called Difficulty. And one of the things that Bunyan alludes to in his book and in all of his allegories is the need for us to stay alert. The need to stay awake, to pay attention to your journey of faith. Because along the road of which you and I as Christians must travel, not only is it difficult, but it is filled with all kinds of dangers. And many times we think, oh, it's all no big deal. We're all good. The picture that Bunyan is making is very clear. Too many Christians think that uh, because they've made some kind of declaration of faith, I'm a Christian, I follow, I follow God, I know God, that they can now just put their life on cruise control, sit back, fold their hands, and just watch life happen. I'm a Christian, so it's all good, right? Like, there's nothing more to do. There's nothing to be watchful for. I don't have to be on guard. That's just, that's just scare tactics. Again, the goal is not to make here feel like there. The goal is to prepare your life and to make ready our lives for there is the celestial city. And that means that the way to get from here to there is through the hills of difficulty. So the book that moves on and talks about some people in the story and there are five of them and let me mention just a few of them interestingly enough and it wasn't shown in the video but three are at the foot of the cross they're chained to a post and they're fast asleep and the three individuals are simple sloth and presumption simple sloth and presumption and having viewed the cross they convince themselves now that everything's great everything's good I've been forgiven my sins. I've left the cross. Everything is well. Why should I pay attention to my faith journey? And they go to sleep. And Christian wakes them up and warns them and says, there are still difficulties along the way. There are still dangers on the way. And Simple goes, what are you talking about? What's you need danger? Life's good. It's good. It's good. Sloth groggily goes, uh, uh, uh. I'm tired. I need some more sleep. Just chill. Don't make... Ah, come on. I go to church. We sing some songs. Just relax. Just, just enjoy it. Let's, don't, don't push this. Uh, this is rest. And presumption. Presumption says, I don't need you to tell me what to do. Who are you? Who are you to tell me? And some of the same responses ring as true in 2017 as they did in 1675. I'm a Christian. Come on. It's all good. My life is safe. My life is happy. My life is blessed. I'm good. God's good. I can handle this. Look at my life. Of course God's blessing me. You know, I need to focus on myself some more. You know, this is my faith. This is not your faith. This is my faith. I need some me time. I mean, church is about what I want. Church is about what I need. Feed me, but feed me my way. As long as I'm getting something out of this, it's nobody else's business. In fact, my life is none of your business. So who are you to tell me? Well, Paul said in 2 Corinthians, examine yourselves, seeing whether or not you are in the faith. Test yourself. Do you not know that Christ is in you? Unless indeed... You are disqualified. Examine yourselves to see whether or not you are in the faith. Test yourself. Did you know that? Did you know that you can be disqualified? When was the last time you tested your faith? When was the last time your faith was under testing? And did you qualify? Did it qualify? So much easier to judge other people, isn't it? 
So much easier to make up your mind as to who's in, who's out, who's right, who's wrong, who's up, who's down. So much easier to decide for them. Test yourself and examine to see if you're in the faith. Unless you be disqualified. The other two characters he meets is hypocrisy and formalists. And you can read about them more, but... They come to this hill, a hill called Difficulty, and there there are three paths and they have to make a choice. One goes straight up the hill and it's steep and it's difficult and it's not going to be easy. One goes around the base to the left, one goes around the right. And Christian knows that the right path is to keep going straight, keep moving forward, but it's steep and it's too hard for formalists and hypocrisy. And so they decide to take level paths and they go around the hill. However, what they don't know is that one path is called dangerous and the other is called destruction. You and I face hills of trial and temptation every day. Every day we face trials and temptations and the challenge before us is the challenge of the path to which we will take. The Bible talks about the different kinds of testing, the examination of our faith and of our lives. In those two words, trials and temptations, it's interesting that in the Greek word it's used the same way. Now some situations can be both a trial and temptation, but in order for us to distinguish between the two, let me suggest this. Trials are situations designed by God in order to help us to grow, but temptations are designed by the devil in order to cause us to sin. Let me say it again. Trials are situations designed by God to help us to grow. Temptations are designed by the devil in order to cause us to sin. And I would encourage you today to pay real close attention to what you're about to hear. Because both can get in you to trouble. Easy roads either for the satisfaction of wrong pleasures or to avoid what God intends to strengthen and mature you will ultimately, avoiding those things, can get you in the wrong place. James says, blessed is the man that endures temptation for when he is tried, that's the trial, when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. So allow me to talk to you today a little bit about both trials and temptations. The Christian life is basically a series of mountain and valleys, ups and downs, highs and lows, good times, bad times, obstacles and opportunities, problems and potentials. There's not a day in your life that you are not confronted with either a temptation to dissuade you in your forward journey or a trial that will appear to you as being too hard to climb and the ability to conquer. It's a surety in this life that you will have difficult days depressing days. And I know this isn't popular, especially on a warm, sunny Sunday afternoon in the middle of the summertime. But we've got this role wrong if we think that you give your life to Jesus and everything's going to be a cakewalk. There'll be days when you feel like, why did I get up this morning? Some of you said that already today. <laughs> days of disappointment when you feel like you're just not making any progress. You're not making any traction. Will I ever get ahead? Days of defeat when you feel like you're a loser, you're a total failure, loneliness, grief. And you'll be tempted to make decisions that will leave you wondering, if my life is good, then I must be in the will of God. But if my life is bad, then somehow God has abandoned me. Why would God leave me like this? Can I be in the worst place of my life and be in the center of God's will? Yes. You will go through some dark days, days when you haven't the slightest idea of where you're headed, no idea where you're going, and that's why you've got to know what the destination is. You've got to know that you're headed to the celestial city because in this life there'll be days when you feel like you're just spinning. Some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. One person who handled a lot of problems like this was Paul the Apostle. And in 2 Corinthians 4, he talked about it and he said, We are pressed on every side by troubles, but we're not crushed and we're not broken. We are perplexed, but we do not give up and we do not quit. We get knocked down, but we get up again and we keep on going. And later on he wrote, We set our eyes not on what we see, but on what we cannot see. For what we see will only last for a short time, but what we cannot see will last forever. And Paul alludes that the secret of enduring the climb is that we set our eyes not on what we see because what we see is difficult. What we see is tempting. What we see is critical. What we see is going to be very destructive. But what is at top, that which we focus on, the celestial city, will last forever. 
And the thing that I need to deliberately focus on when things are not going right or not going good in my life, things that I turn my mind to, my attention to, my focus to, is not the difficulties, not the trials, because that will just cause me to worry. That will cause me to get anxious. And that will tempt me to make all kinds of mistakes on the path and on the journey. But what I focus on is not the external. It's on the eternal. Not my problems, but I look to the God who can solve them. I don't look at the difficulty of that hill, but I set my eyes to the top. And I focus on the goodness of God. More than just being grateful for all the good things that God has done for you. That's great to be grateful today. But to truly understand and accept that God has your best interest at heart. That He loves you and that He knows exactly what He's doing and that He wants good for your life even though you don't understand what you're going through right now. Now let me be clear about this. Not everything that happens in your life is good. You know that. There's a lot of bad things that happen. And I'm not saying that all trials are at the instruction or the prescription of God's plan. But I am saying that God is always good. And He's never surprised. He's never caught off guard. You didn't have a problem or a trial or some difficulty that happened in your life and God go, oh my, I didn't see that coming. God was always aware. And therefore, He's never given up. I am saying that He is always up to something. The something is always better than what we think is best. And that's where we get into trouble. Because we think we know what is best for our life. And we look at our circumstances. We look at the trial. We look at the temptation and say, there is no way that God could be in this. And I'm telling you today that God is in the center of it. And the testing of your faith is to rise up and say, in spite of what I see, I will stand firm. That's what faith means. God can always bring good out of bad if you trust Him. Life is filled with disappointments. Big ones and little ones, but nothing happens in the life of a believer without the Heavenly Father's permission. And if you are a Christian today, if you are a follower of Christ and you've committed your life to Him, then nothing happens by accident. And even the bad that other people cause into your life, God means them for good. And every trial is an opportunity for God to show His glory and power in your life. And again, the role, the path of the Christian is to mature. The goal is to get to heaven. But here in the now is a preparation of your spirit, your soul, your personhood, so that you are ready for the celestial city. And too often we get dismayed, we want to give up on God, and we get discouraged, and we just, we want to throw this all away because life isn't happy. Life isn't what we want it to be. We get bumper stickers on it with Jeremiah 29, for I know the plans that I have for you, plans to prosper you, plans for good, plans for hope and a future. Let me touch a bit on temptation. The oldest temptation known to man, not the one you're thinking of right now, you dirty minds. The oldest temptation known to man is the one that got Adam and Eve and all of us in trouble in the first place. And it is still our greatest temptation today. I'm about to tell you your greatest temptation in all of life. Are you ready? It's the temptation to doubt the goodness of God and His plan and to choose your own path. To avoid the hill of difficulty and take a path of convenience or ease or pleasure. The greatest temptation you will ever face is when God makes a rule and you think you know better. Even when you don't understand it, whatever it is, Satan is going to try to get you to start doubting that God really has his best at heart. And that's at the heart of every temptation that you face today. Why would God make up that rule? God said to Adam and Eve in the garden, you can eat of any tree except this one. Satan comes along and says, your God's not a very good God. I mean, come on. What kind of God would ever limit you? I mean, uh, isn't that what this is all about? Freedom? Isn't that what grace is all about? We can do whatever we want. You serve a, ma a mean God. God puts limitations on you. You know what? It's probably really good fruit. He's saving the best fruit for himself. He's giving you all the crappy fruit. In fact, if you eat that fruit, you'll be like God too. Do you see what he's doing? 
He's getting you to doubt the goodness of God. He's getting you to doubt His plan and His ways. And anytime you don't follow what God says to do in His Word or what His Spirit leads to do, you, to do in your heart, you are doubting the goodness of God. You are doubting His path for your life. So when God says things like sex is reserved only for marriage, He means it. Why? Not because He doesn't want you to have sex, but because He's a good God and He knows what's best for you. And when you say, forget God's rule, I'm going to do what I want to do, you're saying God's path is not good enough. He doesn't know what he's talking about. He doesn't know what he's doing. I know better than God. No, you don't. Anytime you're tempted to deviate from the goodness of God and his path for your life, you're saying you're better than God. And I'm telling you today, you're not. You always get into trouble when you doubt God's love and His goodness. And in this pilgrimage, in this journey, on this path, you will soon figure out, if you haven't already done so, that you're going to find out that things don't go as you planned. And when situations do not go as planned, Satan's greatest temptation in your life is going to get you to doubt His plan. If God is so good, then why did He allow this to happen? He let my loved one die. I lost the promotion. I got fired. Something went wrong. I was in that accident. She left me. They left me. In those times of life, when life does not make sense, when you can't figure it out all in your little brain, when you don't understand it, when it actually feels like a senseless tragedy, and I understand it is a senseless tragedy, that's not when you focus on the tragedy. That's when most of all you need to think about and trust. I serve a God, a good God, a loving God, and He knows what best. He was not surprised, and He has a great plan and a great path for my life, and I need to stay on it. I need to stay on it. I need to stay the course because He's a really good God, and He knows what is best. Even when I hate it, and even when it's tough, and when it hurts, and your heart is breaking, you don't like it, and you don't get it. Examine yourself that you may not be disqualified, that you stay firm in the testing of your faith. Don't get off that path, because danger and destruction will destroy you. You stay on that hard path. You will be tempted. We're all tempted. I'm tempted. You're tempted. Every day we're tempted. You never get too old to be tempted. <laughs> I know that for some of you young people, you just think, yeah, I'm full of temptations right now, but boy, when I get to be the pastor's age, well, then he, I won't be tempted anymore. Uh, is there a bunch of older people in the room that will kind of, thank you, uh, uh, thank you, thank you, thank you. There's this misconception that once you get born again, that you got it all together. That somehow you gave your life to Jesus and you're no longer tempted anymore. That you, you've arrived, so you fake it and you wear a mask. Like, how could anybody do something like that? How could anybody ever think like that? Oh, no, I won't think like that. Once you've been a Christian for a long time, then temptation goes away. <laughs> Not a chance. Not a chance. 1 Corinthians 10 says, No temptation has seized you except what is common to all men. And I can tell you this, I have most, if not all, the same temptations you have all the time. And all the young adults went, Ew. <laughs> yep. Sorry to pop that bubble. There is no place you can reach that does not put the possibility for temptation to compromise your life, your journey, or your trust in God's plan. There is no level that you're going to get to. That means we're all in the same boat. We all have the same temptations, the same problems. So don't be surprised and don't be shocked and stop trying to pretend or to hide it because God knows and we're all in this together. Some of you are caught in compromising situations even right now, but it's liberating to know that there is other people beside you who have the same problems and struggles. It's not a sin to be tempted. It's a sin to get into the to give in to the temptation. It's not a sin to be tempted, it's a sin to give in to the temptation. Now, now don't get me wrong, that doesn't mean that that I'm tempted in the same things now that I was when I was 17. Oh, no, 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 no. That, that, that's changed. The things that 
I was tempted for when I was 17 and 18. I'm not tempted in the same way that I am now in my 50s. But the degree, the severity, the intensity, and the ability to destroy, dissuade, and to keep me from God's best is as strong today as it was when I was 17. A lot of Christians are so ashamed of their temptation. How could I ever have that thought? And it's really creepy to think that your pastor could have that thought too. Are you kidding me? Lots of people have the thought. They're all having the thoughts. The thought isn't the problem. Acting on the thought is when you take it to a whole new level. And I can tell you this. The more committed you are, the more you will be tempted. Not with the same things, but with the key things. Not with the same things, but with the key things. What I was tempted with when I was younger is not what I'm tempted with now. But the temptation is just as great. In fact, it's even greater now because the enemy tailors it right to me, knowing exactly what my patterns are, where I fall, and where I am most vulnerable. Which is why you must examine your why you should be tested. Why you have to be so very careful when it comes to temptation. Because we let our guard down. We get lazy. We go, I got this. No, you don't. No, you don't got this. And any person that's sitting, you're, you're, if you're sitting there today going, ah, chill, pastor. Just chill. I got this. You're on the verge of the greatest fall of your life. Remember, the goal of every temptation is to get you to deviate from the goodness of God and His plan for your life. That's why Paul said, be on your guard. Be on your guard. You stand firm in the faith. Be courageous and be strong. So how do you prepare for temptation? Well, it starts with desires. It starts with I want. It becomes a deception, that which I need. It leads to a decision. I have to choose, which ultimately is disobedience, when I choose to act. It starts with a desire. I want this. I really, 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 really want this. And if you focus on what you really, really, really want long enough, if you look at it long enough, desire it long enough, all of a sudden that which you want will become, I need it. I got to have it. Got to have it. Got to have it. Got to have it. Just got to have it. Got to have it. Can't be without it. Which will eventually, if you do that long enough, it comes to a decision. I choose to have it. I know it's wrong. I don't care. Got to have it. I'm choosing it. That action always brings about disobedience and destruction. This is the sobering thought. You can give your life to Jesus. You can ask Him into your life. Go to church all you want. And still miss out. Miss out on it all. You can do all the right things and still be disqualified. That's why it's a battle. That's why we're to stand firm. That's why we are called to put on the breastplate of righteousness and the helmet of salvation and take up the sword of the Spirit and to hold on to the shield of faith and to put on the belt of truth because there is a battle that still must be won in your life. Am I talking about salvation by works? No. You got to catch the last two messages. We are free to choose any way we want to live. We leave the hill of salvation and we are cho free to choose whatever path we want. Choose the road. Choose the path. Take the easy way. Go left or right or straight up the hill. You get to choose the way you want to live and nobody can tell you otherwise. God gave you the freedom to choose. But here's the kicker. I'm not free to choose the consequences. Choose to live any way you want. But I don't choose the consequences. The path of danger, the path of destruction, or the path of my destiny. The bottom line is it's not mine to determine. I determine the road. I have the freedom to have my kicks, but I'm not a free to eliminate the kickbacks. I'm free to make the choices, but I'm not free to choose the consequences. Martin Luther said, We cannot keep the birds from flying over our heads, but we can keep them from making a nest in our hair. You cannot live in a temptation-free world. It's not a sin to be tempted. So don't be intimidated by that. Don't be ashamed by that. 
It becomes a sin when you dwell on that temptation and allow it to become a need and to get you to stay. God, say, in your heart or in your mind, God's goodness is not good enough. God's path is not nice enough. I choose my own path and I doubt God's goodness for my life. Would you bow your heads? So you have some choices that you're making this week, this day, this season. You're on some paths. You're on some roads. You're on some hills. And you may be struggling with what has been bothering you for years. Some of you have been struggling for years. What's your weakness? What's your hot button? Where does Satan know best to bait you? Well, you know, I've got this tendency to... There's something in my life that's out of control. My time is out of control. My spending's out of control. My lust, my desires, my cravings. It's my emotions. I'm so angry. I get, I just, I set off at a heartbeat. And I say things I should never say. And I hurt people. My unforgiveness, my judgmentalism of others, pride, arrogance. Just confess it. Just talk to God about it. Pour your heart out to Him. Like I said, He's not surprised. He's known all along. All of it is doubting God's goodness in your life. If you're angry, the reason why you're angry is because somebody disappointed you or hurt you and you're mad at it because you think you didn't deserve that. You're right. You probably didn't deserve it. But the anger is just eating you alive. The unforgiveness will destroy you. Judging others is pride. Oh, we can go on and on for another hour. God loves you. He's not condemning you. He wants to forgive you. He wants to wipe the slate clean. He wants you to start all over again. He just wants you to be real with Him. Lord, you promised a way from these temptations. Give me the strength. Lord, Help me to break off this relationship. It's wrong. It's unholy. It's not righteous. I am flirting with some wrong areas in my life. Lord, help me to quit. Help me to stop compromising. And for some of you, you just need to take responsibility. Put your big boy pants on, your big girl pants on. Don't blame your parents or your spouse or your boss, your, your boss or your lousy upbringing or your bad friends. Admit that there is a weakness. You have a weakness. You have sin. And you can't handle it. Remember, there'd be no outside temptation if there was no inward drive to match it. Lord, I come to you today. Help me to recognize those areas and replace them with a desire for your goodness, for your plan, and for your best in my life. Not just to resist my feelings, but Lord, replace those feelings with you. Now, some of you are climbing a hill of difficulty today and it's just too hard. You're going, I, I, it's just, it's too steep. I can't do this anymore, God. It's too hard. It's too high. There's too much pressure. But I would encourage you to pray something like this. Father, I, I believe that you're a good God. You're not mean. You're not mad. And I, I repent. I apologize. If I ever said you were mean, if I ever said you weren't being fair, that's a sin. And please forgive me for that. Forgive me for shooting my mouth off. You love me. You always have my best interest at heart. Your goodness is good enough. Your plan, even though I don't understand it and even though I do not like it, your plan is always, always best. And even though I think it's difficult and unreasonable and impossible, and even though I think you're asking too much of me, Lord, I want to obey you and follow on this path straight up this hill and never doubt your goodness again. When I face disappointments, help me remember that you're good and worthy of my trust. And when I face tragedy, your things that do not, don't make sense. They're beyond the demand of an explanation. 
this hill is worthy of the climb no matter what because it is not about this journey it is about where I'm headed the celestial city that's the goal so I fix my eyes on that which is on top in your name I pray amen Pastor Tim is going to lead and he's going to sing a song today and I just want you to encourage you to take a few moments and let God speak to you. God has called each of us as pilgrims and as Christians to not stop, to not give up, but to climb on, to climb on. And so when my life is plagued with temptation, climb on. When I wonder if it's really worth it, say it with me, climb on. And when my life lacks direction and purpose, climb on. And when I'm hung up with guilt, even after I ask for forgiveness, climb on. And when I pray and I feel like I'm just talking to the ceiling, climb on. And when I want to quit, I don't quit, but I climb on. I climb on. Say it. I climb on. Standing at this mountain top, looking just how far we've come, knowing that for every step you were with us, kneeling on this battleground and seeing just how much you've done, and knowing every victory was your power in us. Scars and struggles on the way, but with joy our hearts can say, yes, our hearts can say, never once did we ever walk alone.
such a faithful God, don't we? We hope today has been a meaningful and beneficial experience for you and that you've been able to identify your next step. Thank you, Pastor Rick, for sharing your heart and this message with us today. Thank you so much for joining us. It's summer. It's Sunday. It's not raining yet, I don't think. So we hope you have a great week. If you can give us a hand by stacking the chairs 10 high, putting them against the side. We're having a skate park uh, or skate camp this week. And so if you can give us a hand with that, we would really appreciate it. Have an awesome week and we'll see you next Sunday.